Okay, everybody, welcome back. Um, sorry to cut your break off short, but I think it is um, very pressing that we get to the next uh, uh, presentation, which I'm extremely excited about. Um, and so uh, this is, of course, a paper by uh, Karen Levy and Tim Huang, um, uh, who I've, I've, I've known for, for some time, although I don't, I mean, Tim, you and I met at Berkeley recently, but have we, have we met before? I feel like uh, you're on a big spot. Been in the same room at least. That's good. But great to see you. And then uh, this is all. You know, also I just met Evan, who I feel like is like my you know good buddy that I've known for years, uh, uh, for physically for the first time. It just goes to show you how the virtual is uh, allowing us to have these relationships. You know, that are actually uh, you know you, we don't actually physically know the person until until you you see them. But anyway, it's so delighted to have all you guys all here. Um, I also really think that this is going to be an interesting discussion. You can see that the paper is sort of pitched at a, a slightly different audience. Um, it's meant to uh, start more of a, of a public conversation in, in many ways than some of the previous more technical papers. And I, I see part of our challenge is to give some uh, guidance on, on uh, how to uh, sort of, uh, you know, how to build this paper into an, an also an academic contribution, which I, I know both of you guys have, have made in the past. But I also really like the fact that it's really accessible and and I think we'll start a public conversation. Um, and Evan uh, Selinger, who is a philosophy professor at RIT, um, has been a, a, a wonderful public intellectual on, on, uh, on the set of issues around uh, robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm, I'm just delighted uh, to, to have you all here. And I'm going to turn it over to, to Evan. Thanks a lot. So thank you, thank you. Ryan. So um, I want to start by asking the audience a question. No one's done real audience questions at the beginning. So this is just an easy one. It's a show of hands. I'm not going to be counting. Go for it. Okay. So how many of you are sort of cynical or skeptical that when you get to the pedestrian crossing and you push the button, you're kind of wasting your time merely hitting a mechanical placebo that doesn't do anything? Show of hands. What a wise, wise room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So it turns out you're, you're probably all right. Um, so just to pick one sort of geographic location. So back in 2004, uh, the Times ran an article on this issue. And what they basically pointed out is sort of by the late 1980s, most of the buttons had been deactivated. Um, computer controlled traffic signals emerged. The problem is the city didn't exactly mount a public awareness campaign. So you have all kinds of people in like real serious numbers sort of dutifully pushing the button, hoping that things will happen. Okay. So I want to use this as a sort of opening example to sort of motivate some of the, the ideas that um, they talk about. Why did this happen? So this is a case where a technology was originally designed to respond to human interaction, but over time it stopped doing so. Pedestrian crossing machines became dispensers of duplicity. So I'm opening with this example because I think there are three sort of salient features with it. Um, in the first case, people are looking at a device and they come to an incorrect conclusion about how it operates. So if you're fooled, you're like, I'm pushing it, it's going to do something. And they're making sort of solid inferences, but these inferences break down because they can't see what's happening under the hood, right? They're just looking at the design, they're pushing it, they're assuming some relation of cause and effect. Um, and what's the cost? Well, it seems kind of minimal, right? People are misled, but at most, a tiny bit of their time is getting wasted. And I should say, to sort of set the stage for the, the conversation to come, although I'm emphasizing this as sort of wasting time, there are people who actually think of this as a good thing, right? Um, this has been referred to in some of the literature as benevolent deception. So some people have been excited about this for the following kinds of reasons. They're like, look, people love the illusion of control. Um, pushing the button gives you stuff to do. And it's even been alleged that social solidarity can be built because as we sort of all impatiently do it and we see other people, we're all in it together. Okay, so let's up the ante. All right. If we want to up the ante, I want to think about some cases where the costs of being deceived are not only high, but they come about due to intentional manipulation on the part of designers and not bureaucratic neglect. And I think that's a really big concern in, in, in the paper that um, Tim and Karen did. Right? They wrote a conceptual paper. They want to expand our theoretical vocabulary so we can think about design in a new way, a way that just might make it easier for us to spot some troubling ethical and maybe even some legal problems too. Now, if you're doing theory, the last thing you want to do is start from scratch, right? This is when like everyone will get on you and say, really, you're, you're standing on the shoulder of greats. And they know that. So they say, listen, we're going to go back to the 1959 sociological masterpiece uh, from Goffman, the presentation of self in everyday life. And people in the privacy space go, yeah, this is very familiar. This has been mined for a very long time, but it's a very rich work. And I think there's a lot more that can come out of it. 
So, as most of you know, but just in case this is new to some, I just want to give this sort of like quick tour for what they're 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 claiming. Um, they turned to Goffman because Goffman had this kind of um, theatrical conception of how it is that human beings interact. Right? He, he talked about our our forms of engagement as being things we could think of as being performances. So he says, on the front stage, uh, we craft our expressions to sort of shape how an audience is going to respond. It's impression management, basically, right? But on the backstage, that's where we try to keep things to ourselves that we're hiding from an audience that they might find objectionable. Maybe some beliefs or intentions that they wouldn't want us to hold or they'd find it inappropriate for us to express. And to make our performances believable, sometimes we've got to try to separate the front and backstage. So here's just like a little example if this is a concept you haven't thought of before. So when I go on social media and I talk about teaching, right, I'm like always like super positive guy. You would think like every day teaching was awesome for me. I mean... Some days it is, some days it isn't, right? Anyone who's taught us, it's not always awesome. But in social media, you have to perform this. I don't know if you know, students are going to see this. It's not the right kind of forum. So if you thought that my views of pedagogy were only the things that I expressed there, and you had no conception of the strategy that I was employing, you would think that, you know, like every day I came in and it was like Socrates talking in the Agora, right? As opposed to students just going like, well, you know, it could have been worse. Okay. <laughs> so now I want to get to their paper and how they want to extend this sort of vision by Goffman to design. And I think they give us two really interesting concepts to consider. So here's the first concept. They call them design theaters. And this refers to how technology can be built with a front stage. And so the front stage, it's sort of like design features that give users and potential users some cues about how to use a device and how reliable it might be and how it operates. But then there's also the backstage. And the backstage are the sort of physical and algorithmic operations, and they determine how a device functions. So that's a design theater. But there's a special type of design theater that they say poses the thorniest of ethical problems. And this is what they call a theater of volition. And this refers to uh, design strategies that give users a sense they've got more control over a situation than they really do. So as I see it in the paper, they want us to think about design theaters. They want us to think about theaters of volition in particular and really try to figure out if theaters of volition are ethically problematic, why? Now, I don't have an easy answer to this, but I want to sort of to, to inspire the conversation, throw out some intuition. So this is, this is the best that I can do for you. So they definitely say all deceptive design is not problematic because there can be some very laudable public goals. So appealing to some of Ryan's work and visceral notice, they say, look, you know, if we can give quiet electric cars some artificial noise that you know, prevent people from being mowed over, that's probably a pretty good thing. And when I heard them say that, I'm like, you know, a lot of this resonated to me, if you're thinking of those cases, with some of the stuff in the nudge literature. And a lot of this kind of behavioral paternalism has come up over the course of the conversations because people like uh, Sunstein and Thaler, they wax poetically about things like, you're in Chicago and you're driving and we could have a sign that's a slow down, but people are going to ignore it. But if we have these crazy, funky, illusory stripes that make people feel like they're speeding, they will choose to slow down. But then, of course, in the nudge literature, it gets even more deep in a sense because they say all of design is going to be choice architecture and affect what you do. So in a sense, we're always creating an illusion of control. You create a little cafeteria display, you put the healthy apples on the front row, and you put the Twinkies on the back, and then people sort of statistically choose the apples. They don't go, wow, I'm being manipulated to choose because of where it's placed. They go, man, I'm going to eat healthy today. So on some deep level, it may very well be the case that there's always a kind of illusion of control. But I want to move past the nudge stuff. I just want to throw that out because I think that might be an interesting thing to talk about. What I want to focus on are uh, a case that they give here. And I wanted to think of a, a very wee robotish case. So what I picked out is they talk about a case that um, in self-driving cars, they say, let's imagine that it's not legally required to have a steering wheel. They say, let's imagine we could have choice. And some automotive manufacturers decide to put on a steering wheel that doesn't really do very much. It's kind of totemic. It has a symbolic function. It gives, it's like a psychological security blanket. It makes people feel sort of comfortable as they're sort of bridging the, the consumer divide between those who are rushing really fast to embrace the new stuff and some going, wow, this is, this is a little unsettling. And I, I think the question that they ask is, is that a problem? Or, and if it is a problem, why might it be a problem? And I've, I've come up with a few things that make me go, well, it could, right? The devil's in the details. So I just want to throw out these things and then open it up to discussion, okay? Um, so here's, here's my first sort of intuition. Um, so if I put my philosopher cap on, I say there, there's a really tight conceptual connection between control 
and responsibility, right? It's the it's the cle- it's the t-shirt phrase of ought implies can, right? Like I can't hold you accountable for stuff that you can't do. I can't say, "Hey Tim, you didn't come to We Robot on a jetpack and I'm going to hold you accountable," or "Hey Karen, why didn't you create world peace?" right? This is beyond their control. I can't hold them accountable. So when we do think people do have some control, this is often when accountability comes in. So let's play with the the car example. So imagine this, two self-driving cars with mostly ornamental steering wheels, they collide. And as a result, all of the passengers in a second car are killed. An entire family tragically perishes. And what I want to motivate us to think about is, is it really implausible to believe that the driver of the first car could feel a heightened sense of responsibility for what happened? Maybe on some level, he comes to believe that if only he grabbed the wheel, the accident could have been avoided. Maybe just seeing the steering wheel and developing some implicit beliefs about it led him to be about overconfident about how much agency he could exert. So notice what I'm doing here. I'm emphasizing that real psychological guilt and real moral self-incrimination can happen based on very subjective hypothetical reasoning. The driver can have these experiences even if the law finds him blameless because objectively speaking, there might not have been meaningful agency to exert, but we don't always think in these very rational terms when it comes to emotionally heightened tragedy. But let's flip the situation around, right? What if instead of self-incrimination, one person survives in the other car? And they hold the person in the first car responsible, even though he couldn't have done otherwise, because the mere presence of that steering wheel makes the person feel, I know you could have zigged instead of zagged. What could happen? I mean, not only just moral self-incrimination, but I mean, if his family perishes, we could imagine revenge or worse. So that, that's one sort of issue I have, right? We need to sort of, I think, potentially disentangle the objectivity of who is causally responsible from whether the design environment here sort of produces such a heightened illusion of control that incorrect moral accountability comes to be sort of proffered. And then if we start moving this a little bit, my second thought is that this does raise some questions, and this is uh, stuff the legal scholars out there can answer, is when the threshold of deceptive advertising is breached, right? The, the mere existence of a steering wheel, it can send a signal that a certain type of a car is being sold, especially if the market becomes dis- diversified, so that you have some cars with steering wheels and you have some cars without them, and consumers think that purchasing one over the other is actually exercising a meaningful choice. And I think a lot of the way that'll probably get worked out has to do with how like the corporate literature, like the automotive manuals and the commercials uh, sort of portray what these steering wheels can do, right? And might someone reasonably believe that an override function exists that doesn't and come to be shocked to learn that it doesn't when the time comes to use it? So this brings us uh, to some broader implications than just the cases where a deceived driver goes, man, I wish I would have bought the other car. Because of the self-incriminating crash I mentioned a few moments ago, I think we need to ask some tough questions about whether the existence of a steering wheel itself, whether that can play a decisive causal role. And if it does, I don't know how you would go about proving it, right? I mean, I think this is part of the open empirical stuff that I was asking Woody with respect to some of the stuff that um, we heard from the, the, the previous talk. Okay. Third point, third out of five, you're almost there. So if the intention underlining the design choice is to sort of assuage the worry of irrational consumers, How do we disentangle the self-serving financial incentives from what some might deem legitimate public good paternalism? In other words, even if the heads of automotive companies truly and sincerely believe that self-driving cars are going to reduce accidents and they're morally obliged to create safer vehicles, does it follow that they're justified in using deceptive design to lower the guard of consumers who might otherwise choose to spend their money on more traditional vehicles, maybe offered by competitors, that could have any number of sort of value-laden reasons for that? And that sort of transitions to my fourth sort of concern, which is, how do we know if it's about overcoming psychological hindrances, like status quo bias, so that people make really informed judgment, or using design to sort of steer people away from having moral reservations? I mean, I think one way this could be sort of put forth is, well, consumers are really not looking at this correct. They've got the cognitive bias of status quo. They're not appreciating all the safety features. So we really need to just sort of steer them, pun intended, on that course. But maybe that's not an irrational fear, right? Maybe, you know, as people like Peter have written about, maybe it's this issue of moral reservations about opting into machines that can make life or death decisions as proxies for us. So when would design be a way of sort of um, designing around moral debate that ought to be prominent in the public sphere? And my last sort of point is, I, I do think we need to look beyond 
if we're thinking about this overall, any particular instance of when this or that theater of volition is created, and think about it in terms of a potential trend starting. Think of proliferation. So the more products that are designed to mislead us about automation, potentially the harder it can become for any of us to confidently approach other automated products. In this sense, the risk is that designing theaters of volition potentially can, in the aggregate, chip away at consumer confidence and undermine the goals that depend on it. So I'm kind of done, I want to open this up, but I also want to put Jason Millar, that's right, you Jason Millar, in the hot seat, because I think a lot of people will have things to say, but I know that Jason's going to be delivering this amazing talk um, at the UN, where, little spoiler alert, I'm trying to coax you to come up here, I believe you're <laughs> talking about whether we could design situations with respect to drone warfare that keep humans in the loop, but only nominally, and give them the appearance of control when it's not there. So I've been focusing on hypotheticals, jumping off this with automated car cases, but I think there might be some sort of drone warfare analogs that some of this discussion could move to also. All right, I'm done. Thanks. Should we start with that, Jason? <laughs> no pressure. Uh, so Jason Miller from uh, Queens University, uh, also Carlson University. So thanks for the paper. It was really interesting. Um, I, I mean, I wasn't expecting the the cue. So um, <laughs> uh, what can I say? I, you know, it's it, it's Evan and I had a chat uh, last weekend. Uh, we were participating on a panel together at uh, a philosophy conference, uh, and we kind of had this chat in a, during a cab ride about what was upcoming um, this next week at the UN. And so, uh, he, and he had sort of told me about what he was going to be mentioning today in, in, in the context of this paper. Um, so I don't know what else to say other than to maybe uh, offer up the thoughts that I gave to Evan and then maybe that can, um, uh, uh, you know, um, simulate some sort of conversation about it. Uh, I guess, the, so in working through uh, this idea about um, uh, you know, psychology and uh, the, the, the talk I'll be giving at the UN is, is very short, but it's, it's it basically I outline some concerns that I have uh, about uh, the focus on meaningful human control in the context of uh, lethal autonomous weapons and this idea that when we're designing algorithms um, in, 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 say, uh, in one context, like a civilian use, so you might have algorithms that are used for uh, say, picking out uh, interesting types of human behavior in a crowd uh, that, get a, that, that, that then get applied in the context of lethal autonomous weapons, um, that depending on, so, so depending on the psychology of the user, so this person that you're uh, placing in the, in the role of maintaining that meaningful human control, uh, you know, we could very subtly uh, I think the way I describe it to Evan is, you know, if I put my evil engineer hat on and sort of imagine uh, ways of getting around the notion of meaningful human control, and again, I'm not suggesting that this is what engineers do by any means. I, I think it's, uh, the reality, I think it's just subtle uh, and completely unintentional. Uh, but the, that you could, uh, because of the way that um, these kind of algorithms cue people uh, to do certain things, um, that you could essentially automate the process and still have the human in the loop. Like you could automate the kill decision, right? Because they're, uh, because of the way that, uh, um, uh, that sci like human psychology and moral judgment works uh, in a particular use context. So that, I mean, that's the discussion that we had. So maybe, um, I don't know how well that applies to what you want to talk about or if, if, if you could sort of comment on that. Um, but yeah, it's like, so... So I guess the theater of design comes in in, 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 in this notion that you have uh, that you have someone who you are claiming has meaningful human control over the kill decision, uh, but because of the subtle cues and psychological um, psychological setup of the automation process, you've actually eliminated whatever it is that you were trying to preserve meaningfully by having the human there. Um. Yeah, thanks, Jason, especially for the sort of coerced participation. <laughs> um, but that was fantastic, especially considering that you didn't know you were going to be talking. Um, no, I, th I think 
So I love that example in part because like that's about as high stakes as it gets, right? I mean, the most high stakes example, most of the examples, as Evan mentioned, I think in our paper are relatively like small scale things like a button in an elevator um, or a thermostat in an office that you think you can control, but you can't, right? So, you know, the harms, you know, maybe as, as Evan pointed out, the harms in aggregate um, do accumulate, right, in terms of the way we generally interact with uh, systems that we actually don't have control over. Um, but you know, on on each basis, like there's even an art, like like Evan again said, there's even an arguable um, case that these things are are socially beneficial and that they create solidarity or whatever. Like it's like two seconds out of your day, it doesn't matter. But obviously, like if we're talking about an autonomous weapon system about which we want there to be like very robust public debate and understanding, you know, that's like that's huge, right? That's like much bigger even than the self-driving car example. Um, and I think actually, like one thing that your that your comments make me think of is is I mean. You know, I guess I'm supposed to say that Woody is a tough act to follow, but actually I think Woody is like a really easy act to follow in this case because, Ouch. This, which I mean like entirely <laughs> positively, because <laughs> Woody's great. Um, but I just mean that your paper, I think, presents like almost, almost like the perfect inverse of what we're talking about, right? Like there's this Wizard of Oz effect, which, you know, in which the man is behind the curtain. And I think, you know, the, the system that you're alluding to and that we talk about in the paper is kind of when, you know, the man is in front of the curtain, but like actually everything is happening behind the curtain, um, which which does kind of raise this this similar question about deception, um, but in sort of the inverse case. So. Uh, hi, Jack Beglin. I'm a student at Yale Law School. Um, so my question is, you talk about non-functional design theater and the motivation is supposed to be giving people the illusion of more control over the objects. I'm interested in sort of non-functional design theater that's meant to do the opposite, so to complexify the actual appearance of the task a robot is do doing. Do you have an example in mind? Um, I don't exactly, but I'm just going to say, I'm going to use the self-driving car example, but I'll say imagine 45 years in the future when not everyone actually is a licensed driver themselves. And let's say you made the car look more complicated in driving. You added an extra steering, steering wheel or four or five pedals, a number of buttons. What you could do is this could actually engender reliance upon like the robot itself, because you have now doubted your ability to assume this task um, in the event that the robot wouldn't do it. And so like the non-functional design theater would actually be a way of like advertising for the robotics itself. So instead of giving- Right, you're like designing for intimidation. Yeah. Right, right, no, exactly, but designing right. for intimidation. So like, I'm now gonna have to keep buying this self-driving car because there's no way I could ever do a task this complicated. Hmm. And instead of giving me the control, you could use it for the um, like a sort of opposite reason. Yeah, As one, yeah sorry. right. Sorry, I think that kind of design is like weaponized already. You know, it, it brings in the parallel of kind of like privacy controls, right? So it's like remarked uh, a few years back on like how Facebook structures privacy controls is that there's so many controls that most people are just like, we'll just have the defaults be the defaults. Uh, and I wonder whether or not there's like a similar like dark pattern here that you could imagine using, right? Which is like you add lots of like dials and gizmos. Um, and yeah, and, and I, I think I'm really intrigued by Evan's suggestion that like maybe there's like a leakage effect. Like if robots are a class and you approach every robot with a certain set of background assumptions about how that system behaves, then like the notion of design theater or like deception might erode trust in like robots as a whole class of objects that you approach. Uh, and I guess we can debate about how much like people use that as a conceptual category, like oh hey, you know I'm I'm an I'm going to an elevator or I'm you know in a self-driving car or I'm you know using an intelligent system in my phone, and these are all examples of something that I class together, and like how design choices on one sort of impact the assumptions made about others, I think is is pretty intriguing. Woody, so great job, guys. I I love this paper. I can't wait to read it in uh, its its kind of more fleshed out form as well. Um, one of the questions I had, uh, and I wonder if you could think to this, is a lot of the examples you give um, about kind of the, this, these um, placebo effects and these, these buttons and, and the, the presentation of, of design, they're done for different reasons, right? So sometimes it's to keep horses from freaking out. Sometimes it's to, it, you know, uh, assuage it to make the user feel better about something. Uh, sometimes, and there are lots of different reasons why we have this. And it occurred to me that I wonder if, if there's a, um, uh, a kind of a categorization that you can think about um, to, you know, 
Evan and I have never met a taxonomy we didn't like. So, um, and so to think about <laughs> reasons why we have these things, and, and, and that matters because, uh, one, it, ma it might matter how long it's acceptable to do it, right? So, so sometimes we just do these things to make you feel better about it, and then over time we can just dump it. Like, so the steering wheel, maybe we'll keep it on a car for a little while, and eventually someone's going to be like, why the hell do we have a steering wheel on this car? And they're going to get rid of it. Um, but maybe the crosswalk buttons we have just to keep you occupied so that, you know, you're, you you don't endanger yourself, right? Or, or uh, you know, so you run out in the middle of the street or something like that. And so, um, and so maybe there are reasons why we have these, and that might give us clues as to what we need to do with them and when they become problematic. Um, and so I don't know if you've thought about that or, or, or not, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about that. Yeah, I mean, I, like I, we actually just had this conversation that we think that ta a taxonomy, like a more delineated taxonomy, is definitely the way to go. And we, we, I think we hint at it in the paper yeah, in saying, know. like, oh, well, these theaters of volition, like these are the ones, like we don't care so much about like skeuomorphic design, right? You know, like does like aesthetic people get really riled up about that stuff, but like ethically, it doesn't strike me at least as being like not at the top of my list of problems to solve, right? But. Um, but these volitional theaters where people believe that they have more control than they do, I think strike me as, as sort of a unique or m like the most acute ethical situation. Um, and I think you're right. In some ways, it kind of recalls actually what I think Kate does really well in her paper, you know, in sort of um, separating and, and uh, problematizing this idea that, you know, like in, in that case, right, that sometimes we want people to have this emotional connection that like is sort of uh, visceral or imagined or, you know, based on emotion and other times we don't and it just depends on the purpose to which the technology is put um, and I think we could do something similar for sure, um, sort of drawing on that on that inspiration to say like, okay, in some cases, like, yes, this really is benevolent or like the social good that's produced by people, you know, I don't know that there's a ton of social good produced by people like hitting a button at a crosswalk. Social solidarity. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't, people say that, I don't really under, like, I never feel close to the people around me when I hit the well, button. Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> so the reason, the reason that lots of mirrors have reflections on them is because we, it gives us something to do, right? So we know that people are kind of less anxious. That lots of what? Uh, do, so it, the elevators sometimes oh, have, elevators. are oh. reflective. The reason why, at least as I've read, is because um, we get anxious when we're just standing there, right? And that leads to kind of negative social interaction and anxiety and and so if we get the mirror, then we can kind of obsess over the way we look. We're distracted. <laughs> Kills a lot right? of time, yeah. And then, and, then, and then everything's better, right? So it's like a, it's this kind of uh, social cohesion and, and easing things, uh, easing social interaction. Um, and so, you know, that's just a, a one possibility. So. Yeah, I mean, thinking through the problem of taxonomy, which I think is, is really interesting, is that the problem is, like, radically different intentions can give rise to the exact same theater. Right. Um, so if you think about yes. like the embodiment of intelligent systems as a kind of theater, right? Like we could we could design it to look like a humanoid robot, even if we don't. Like one intention could be like, ha ha, people give more information to something that's cute and fluffy, so we'll design it like this. The other one can be, boy, it'd be really easy. Like people like really take to something, and, and we want to make it easy for them to understand and interact with this intelligent system, so we'll design it to be cute and fluffy, right? So the, the taxonomy can't come from the dimension of the intentionality that's placed into the 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 design. Yeah. And also, it doesn't seem useful to taxonomize on the basis of the theater. The problem seems to be that you have to taxonomize on the basis of the impact to the user, ultimately, right? But depending on the psychology of the user, like, it seems difficult to make generalizations about. So I think you're like, you've got blocks every step of the way in terms of how you might draw clear lines on these things. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, I guess we'll go back. Great. Mike Cattell, I'm at the University of Washington here at the Information School. Um, great paper, great idea. I really love the idea of, of design theater. Um, I'm going to steal that. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, just to, 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 to continue on this question of taxonomy, I just have a very brief comment, which is the, another shade of, of, uh, of, of deception, I suppose, um, that I've been thinking about and trying to figure out what to do with is the question of uh, false iconography around controls. So for example, if you look on your smartphone camera uh, to switch to the video mode, there's a, probably a little uh, image of an old style movie camera, which most people have actually never touched in their lives. Uh, most audio applications use the iconography of, of real, real to real tape. Again, most of us have never used real to real <laughs> <A what>? tape. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so people of a certain generation have never actually uh, used a cassette player, right? But th that's the iconography that we still use 
um, in, in a lot of cases. And I think what's going on there is that we are hiding the complexity of systems behind these, um, these simplified touchstones. So it's sort of the opposite. Instead of having a control that you think gives you control but actually doesn't do anything, what you actually have is a really simplified, dumbed-down control, which is doing something that's just way outside of your you know, easy conceptual understanding. And I just wanted to drop that in as a possible you know, additional dimension of the potential taxonomy of, uh, of this different control theater. Yeah, definitely. You know, one of the sorry. No, go oh, ahead. yeah. One of the examples we were thinking about was um, that I guess that we didn't put in was uh, I think actually no, we do mention it is actually like the the gas pedal or the brake pedal in your car, right? Which like used to be mechanical, but like now you push it and it doesn't actually go to anything mechanical, right? And so like the the pedal still like it's an interface, but it doesn't actually connect to the same thing that it uh, used to. Right, right. And it goes to, I guess, whether or not you think that there's a sufficiently big distinction between, like, software-based systems and mechanical-based systems, right? Because I guess, like, part of the problem is, like, if you have the cassette tape, then maybe the problem is that you give the notion to the user that it, like, should behave like a cassette tape. Like, that maybe that's in, even instantiated in the code that, like, there's a notion of, like, the tape that moves, and you know. Um, but that might lead you to make all sorts of, like, poor decisions about what it is exactly that's happening. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a, it, I think that's a really good point. And uh, I mean, so we know that people respond, you know, in this very visceral way to this sense of, st I mean, it's sort of path dependence, but it's also like, I think one of the reasons we drew on Goffman um, and why I think anthropological theory actually holds a lot of promise here is that like, we know that even, even like a believed sort of historical continuity matters to people, even if there is actual no historical basis in fact. So like, this is going to seem like it has nothing to do with robots and it doesn't, but um, <laughs> like I... <laughs> And it's gross also, but I'm just going to go with it. Um, so I went to a talk recently where a woman, a sociologist of gender, was talking about this practice of consuming your placenta, um, where women, like, in, it's like a it's like a West Coasty thing, apparently. Like, I guess it happens in California. I don't know. I live in New York. I've never, like, I don't know anyone who does this. Um, but everybody here is probably doing it. It's an audience um, question. <laughs> no, but you, there are, like, these services where you can pay to, like, have your placenta encapsulated. You could take it as pills, or you could, there's all kinds of disgusting things you can do with it. Um, but anyway, the presentation was about, like, how this has emerged as a practice. And if you look at, like, the rhetorics and discourses that have emerged in these mostly online communities of women um, who are, like, proponents of this practice, you know, the belief is, like, this is an ancient thing that people have always done. And, like, you know, there was a reason, like, there, there are, like, imputed biological reasons why this is beneficial, none of which actually bear out in science. In science. Um, and nobody actually used to do this. Like, there's no anthropological evidence that this has ever happened before that people consume their own placentas. Um, but there's a belief, right? And, like, that belief, like, is really meaningful to people. And, like, they draw on that in, in for them, I guess, a very productive way. Um, what does that have to do with our paper? I think, I think, um, I think it connects, right? In that, like, there is this, this kind of, I mean, it's sort of the real to real Tate. Like, even if there's, like, no factual connection, even if there never were, was a factual connection um, with like sort of a more mechanical way of doing things or a different, um, you know, sort of backstage by which things happen, I think actually looking at, at anthropology and looking at the desire people have to have this historical continuity and the comfort that that gives them um, actually like is a real, a real force that sort of lends itself to these types of deceptions. Yeah, and there's almost like um, there's like an artifact laundering effect where like yeah. essentially like by putting the tape recorder icon there, you say like no, this is not a robot or like this is not a piece of software. It's in fact just like a tape recorder and is an analog to the tape recorder and is like just the latest sequel in that rather than being an entirely different class of things. Uh, I mean, maybe that's that partially accounts for the problem why people have a tough time thinking holistically about like robotics and robots in general is because like because exactly we use these theaters you know, we tend to think of these things as just like the latest iteration of like the past tool. And the, the icon is just like a way of like reemphasizing that again. Hi. It's a little low. Um, my name is Tim Brown. I'm with uh, <laughs> University of Washington, uh, Washington Philosophy. Um, I'm also uh, a neuroethicist embedded in the biorobotics lab. Uh, these fine gentlemen and women here. Um, um, and I just wanted to say, what a great paper. I really love this paper. And this one uh, appeals, appeals to me in particular because I do a lot of uh, work in aesthetics. And uh, I love this notion of a uh, theater of volition. And I'll probably steal it. Um, like everyone else here is going to steal <laughs> nice. your idea. Um, and we'll cite you, of course, maybe. Um, 
So, um, so if I have this correct, uh, you're thinking of examples where in the front stage a person feels as though they have control, but in the backstage they don't actually have that much control. Um, I was wondering if we could think of a couple of examples of where a person has a lot of control, uh, but uh, in the backstage, but in the front stage you don't want them to feel as though they have a lot of control. Um, so um, this this relates to my work with the biorobotics lab because we're working on, and if you guys stay till the end of the day and hear our paper that we're giving, um, <laughs> I hope you guys do. It's going to be awesome. Um, um, we're working on uh, volitionally controlled deep brain stimulators for essential tremor um, and Parkinson's. Um, and one of the things that we worry about is that uh, the, the current state of these devices, sometimes they have... Uh, manual controls, hand controls, but you can't actually use them when you're tremoring. Um, and that seems like a, a, a terrible design flaw. Um, and so we want to make it to where the devices are neurally controlled. So you think them on or think them off, or think up a level of, of treatment or stimulation. Um, but that might seem cumbersome. You might think that you're becoming like a cyborg. I know everybody here is okay with the idea of becoming a cyborg, <laughs> but <laughs> um, that might not appeal to a person with Parkinsonian tremor or uh, essential tremor. Um, they may not want to be confronted with the fact that they have control of this device that's embedded in them, that's implanted in them at every moment of the day. So maybe on the backstage they have a lot of control, but on the front stage they don't have so much control, unless they really want it. So what do you guys think of that case, or uh, what do you think of the idea? Do you have any other examples? Does anybody here have any other examples? <laughs> so I'm, just to make it clear, so these are examples in which, like, you don't want the person to know that a machine is working for them yeah. effectively. Or that they have such control over, or, or they have control over uh, a complex machine. So you want to simplify the process, or at least make it seem simpler than it is. Think uh, I don't know Windows ninety five instead mm -hmm. of DOS. <laughs> right. I, don't know. I mean, I guess these are cases where you really do want the robot just to look like a hammer, right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Where like it looks like a hammer and maybe doing a ton of things, but like your behavior, your experience with it is like a complete passive object. Um, and you know, it might be sensing, it may be pulling a lot of information in, it might be adjusting like its weight so you can really use it really well, but, but gives no indication that it's actually doing so. So these would be the examples of like, I guess robots or intelligent systems that are like, like are the, the theater of just being completely like a passive object, right? Like having no intelligence whatsoever, despite being highly intelligent. And so I guess wondering that like. You know, you, you may eventually see that, I guess, with some of the, like, Internet of Things stuff, right, where you have, like, your Internet-connected toaster, but, like, people will not want any more features. Well, they might not want any more features, but you can imagine toasters that just continue to behave exactly as they are, even though, like, the stuff running under the hood gets incredibly complex and is, like, machine learning on how to make the best toast for you. Um, I don't know. Other examples? Yeah, I... I, no, I have no other examples. It's, a, it's an interesting, at first, so at first what I thought you were talking about was sort of the same effect Woody talked about, about this like Wizard of Ozing, but it's actually different, right? Like, because in your case, like the user himself or herself is the wizard. Is that, I may be like stretching that metaphor past where it goes, but I, I think that's what, what it is, right? Because it's not that there's a user interacting with the system that has people, you know, at the front or backstage, right? It's that the person, him or herself is ultimately in control. So it's, a, yeah, I don't have any other examples, but it's an interesting twist, especially because like it's sort of, some of the concerns it raises are actually, I think, very similar to the theaters of volition that we talk about, you know, in terms of like, we want consumers to like, potentially, like maybe it's really good, right, if people with Parkinson's can get comfortable with those systems, right? Like maybe it's ultimate, it's, it's a paternalistic determination, but maybe it's ultimately better for them. So you still do have this like consumer acceptability sort of mandate that the design can serve. You know, but maybe with like a, a different, like the reverse actual effect of the theaters of volition that we talked about. I have like all I'm doing is restating your question. It's an interesting, <laughs> it's a really interesting point. I, I haven't thought about that at all. I really like that term, self wizarding. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a lot of people muttering it as you yeah. said it. It's pretty <laughs> awesome. Um, but thank you, thank you for. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, so, so uh, uh, one of the things that that uh, I feel like is, has been coming up today. Um, 
a few times, has been the role of design and changing our, our mental models. And it's been observed by a few quarters that uh, sometimes when you have a design that is so strong, um, even when you tell people orally, you know, this is not go what's going on here, you know what I mean? Um, you know, these things aren't connected uh, to, to the actual uh, p crossing sign. Uh, people still will sit there and, and, and hit the thing, right? Or, or they'll still feel all the effects that Kate and, and I and others talk about, even though you tell them it's just a robot and, and so forth, right? Um, I, I'm trying to reconcile that with an equally robust line of research that says that rhetoric matters. For instance, a Stanford study that suggests that if you talk to people about crime, like it's a predator stalking the city, they'll recommend that you lock it away. But if you talk about it like a disease, eating away at the, you know, and then they'll, they'll talk about, you know, maybe we should do social services in response. Um, and these effects are very robust. Uh, and I, so I wonder if you're aware of any work um, uh, setting those two things into conflict, talking about the power rhetorically about how we do things and, 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 and position it against a design intervention, right? Um, and, I, and I say that um, in part because there are real um, conversations happening right now uh, in the drone space where uh, there's a lot of people uh, in, in, in the research community and in the industry who just don't like that word. Right? And, and rhetorically, they're just real concerned about it. And they're more concerned about um, you saying something's a drone than you showing a picture of a Predator B drone when you're talking about a quadricopter. You know what I mean? Um, and it gets heated, you know? I mean, um, and so, I don't know, I just wondered if, if uh, I feel like you'd be a good panel, to be well positioned to sort of think about that conflict. Yeah. As there were of any papers research? I mean, no, no. it seems like Kate's paper kind of gets at that, or some of the suggestions, at least, that were made, or, or conversations about the extension that that paper could take, right? Like, you know, where it, it is this rhetorical framing around, like, is this, does this bug have a name? Like, what's his personality? Versus what he looked like, and, and some of the points you raised, right, about, like, well, if it looks like a cockroach versus it looks like a baby, you know, like, that's kind of the viscera. Like, you could conceive of, like, a two-by-two two study where you would marry the framing with, um, with sort of the visceral appearance and see... Yeah, or even what? to like, yeah, like set them in conflict too, I wonder. Yeah. Like, um, it's like a successor project because ultimately both of them, whether or not you use rhetoric or whether or not you design it in a certain way, it's all storytelling about the machine, right? You're like, how do I give you a mental picture of like what's going on behind the scenes? And yeah, I wonder whether or not you could do an experiment where like the robot looks like a baby and behaves super like a baby and you're like, this is just a robot. It's just wires. Anyways, destroy it. Right. <laughs> or like you have another one where it's like it's a cockroach. But and this is kind of the experiment that has been done. Right. This is a cockroach. But let me tell you a very elaborate story about like its friends and what color it likes and where it likes to shop in the last movie it saw. Right. And, like, and then you're like now destroy it. Right. Like and, and in both of those cases. Right. Like the narrative is going sort of full throttle against the, the, the appearance of the machine. Um, and, and I guess. Right. The, the game will be like in which cases does sort of the rhetoric win and which cases does like the design win. Because um, I think both are relevant, right? Like in the, the drone versus UAV case, it's like very much in those lines because like drone has so much baggage. What, what did, you, did you find anything along? I mean, I, you know, your, your paper stimulated this, this question, but I wonder if you found anything like that in your, in your no, results. We're, we have to do some subsequent studies because we found such conflicting effects of the movement because it was cockroach like. So while it was very light, like, So um, we, what we did want to get at is, you know, if you compare these two effects, which one is stronger? Um, but we have to do another two rounds to actually. Yeah, and I'd be really curious if you set your views internationally, what it looks like, right? Because like different cultures have very particular cultures with regards to their relationship to objects. And so I think it'd be really interesting to find like, oh, there's actually this interesting cross-national or cross-cultural issue where in some cases like the rhetoric, the story that you tell about it actually has a bigger effect than the design and in some other places where like the visual representation of the object is the more powerful factor. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I guess that's an open question. I don't know if the, that, that project's been done. Uh, I guess we'll switch back here. Yeah, um, in fact, something you just said, made, or the, Mike Vanderloos, UBC, um, something you just said uh, was actually very relevant to my question. That's about mental models of an interaction. 
And I think there, there's, um, well, you, you talk a bit, you know, laughingly about the, the crosswalk buttons that don't work, but the purpose of those non-functional buttons is not to give people some sense of solidarity, but is perhaps to tell people, this is a crosswalk. I mean, you're not allowed to cross everywhere, but now there's a button that is actually, actually it's an icon, it happens to move a little bit. But so the function of that button has been completely changed, perhaps now because of the new city government. But um, so I think we need to like, remember what an, the, the role of an icon is not specifically to what it's, it seems to be intended to, to show. So the steering wheel in a car, it's not that you hang on to it so that you can direct the car, it's to tell you where the front of the car is. So I think we, we need to think a bit uh, more broadly about what you just mentioned, this mental model of function. Uh, can I just ask you, what, yeah. what we, I mean, do, if I were to Occam's razor it, what makes you think, like, the simplest explanation for me in some cases would be bureaucratic neglect, not the strategic yeah. sort of dissemination of icons that would give people a sense of, like, the significance of what's happening. So what, what makes you, like, it sounded as if you're speaking about this in a very intentional way, like once upon a time it had this function, but then there was like some cabal meeting and everyone decided like it would be like, how do you know there's any other kind of intentionality behind it in the way that you're, you're describing it? Yeah, but you're saying it almost doesn't matter, right? Like a neglectful windfall yeah. is actually great. <laughs> but we shouldn't necessarily ding the bureaucrats for not having enough budget to pull the buttons off their, off their crosswalks is, what, is what, sort of what I'm saying. Um, so we, I mean, and we can intentionally design things into a larger artifact that do have some, uh, that the, do provide people a way, to, a scaffold to create a better metal, mental model of the function of your autonomous device, like a, like a car. So we've been developing, you know, robot skin that indicates when is a robot arm actually creating a lot of torque kind of like the icy hot thing pack that you put on your elbow it's like a, to uh, to make your pain go away so there are there are ways of having an actuator and an, and an indicator actually interchange functions so also this icon of a cassette okay we don't we have a mental model okay a cassette it has some ability some affordances like fast forward and stuff like that so it's not the cassette per se, but is that we have an expectation of those functions that we don't necessarily have control over, but that the robot has, can be turned into, can be morphed into. So I think it's uh, these, these pseudo affordances can have some, function, some, have some functionality in, in terms of our being able to create better mental models of what it does, yeah, rather I, than what we can do with it. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's kind of the, the design argument behind like skeuomorphic sort of like these vestigial uh, features. You know, why is it that an e-reader looks like it's turning a page, right? There's like a thing that you, you know, like that's how we know where the page, that's how we know how to get to the next page, right? Is because like we've all used real books, right? So I think the questions that arise are like how, you know, again, how do you distinguish between those which are sort of, you know, benevolent and usability focused and which like even, you know, like, people like Donald Norman and people who are like really big on functional design and, and, you know, providing useful usability cues to people. Like most people I think don't have much of a problem with, with systems that do what you're talking about, but drawing the distinction between that and then these sort of, um, you know, volitional theater uh, questions where like, the, you know, there's not necessarily malintent there, but where um, the amount of control and then the follow on accountability that, that, that is sort of concomitant with that is like di more difficult to disentangle. And then also, um, you know, how long we let those features persist before we say like, okay, you know, let's be more, let's be more honest, right? Or like, like, let's create a new, new icon um, that, you know, more accurately represents where we are now. Yeah, so I guess just to say that you have deception, then you have benevol benevolent deception, but I think then one step further is, is like scaffold, uh, mental model scaffolding. Mm -hmm. And I think so that, I think that some of these icons actually serve a, a very useful purpose. Yeah, I guess there's kind of a question that lurking underneath what you're saying is whether whether or not there's any truly useless theaters, um, because you can you can tell kind of a just so story with any object, where you say because we continue to create objects uh, with this feature, even though they might be useless, there's got to be some reason why it's still there. Because if it no longer served a purpose, we'd either get rid of it uh, or it'd disappear over time. And so you know you can kind of make this argument, I suppose, that like. You can read into any object, even if there is a kind of useless feature that it now serves, must serve some other purpose. Like there's always maybe not intentionality to the design of the object, but there's like um, it, it's serving some, like it's providing some utility in some sense. Security theater might be the exception. Sorry? Security theater might be the exception. <laughs> right. 
Okay, so I apologize because I haven't like fully fleshed this out. Um, <laughs> so if it doesn't make sense, it's probably because it actually doesn't make sense, not because we're not understanding. <laughs> um, all right. So, so what I'm what I'm most interested in, instead of like uh, big taxonomy, I'd actually love to have you guys narrow in more, possibly in the remaining like four minutes on this panel, um, particularly on this nostalgia slash skeuomorphic volitional theater idea. Um, and my interest comes from uh, this idea, Harry Surden's written about this and a couple of other people in like the privacy law space have written about this. Um, this idea that people in their moments of interaction rely on features of their environment um, that are sort of the known features of the environment and so they make behavioral decisions based on those features. And they're, where the environment changes in some way, um, and in your case would be giving off cues that it's actually exactly the same environment, um, Certain has argued that that's the time when you want to have regulation come into place to, to replace what he calls the latent structural constraints that were in the original environment. Um, and so that would be, that framing would be a different way of thinking about this instead of looking at like bad intent. Um, it helps you articulate like the harm to the actual, you know, person in that volitional theatrical environment. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what you think about, you know, that particular, the particular problem of exploitation of nostalgia to in indicate false features about an environment and where laws place might be in that. That's the question, huh? <laughs> no, that's, I mean, that's like, that's, I think that is the question um, that we like tiptoe around in the paper and don't answer precisely because I don't think we have a fantastic answer, right? I mean, um, you know, some of it I think comes down to kind of what Ryan wrote about in his visceral notice piece, right? Where like you look at um, sort of what the net social benefits are. I mean, that piece, I don't think, well, I guess it does get at nostalgia, right? I mean, like Elgin no engine noise is in some sense a form of nostalgia. I mean, sometimes in this very like cultural, emotional way for people and sometimes just in the sense of it's, you know, a developed cue. Um, so there is a place for that, right? Like I think, you know, at, at one point, you know, the regulatory agency was saying like, no, what we're gonna require is that everybody, um, you know, overlay the sound of an internal combustion engine on an electric vehicle. They all ended up saying like, that's not what we're gonna do. But that was like the consideration for a long time was like, you know, no, we're actually like gonna mandate this out of date technology, like, you know, theater as a way to like keep people safe, right? So I think a lot of it probably comes down to like sort of a, like a typical regulatory cost benefit um, analysis, which sometimes can invoke nostalgia or invoke emotion um, as a way to, uh, you know, be protective or be paternalistic, but just like with all the nudge stuff, right? The line between that and, you know, just manipulating people is like so hard to actually identify what it is. So I'm not answering your question, um, but but I, I think that's the my, question. My flag, like, I think that is the most interesting yeah. line. Yeah, no, I agree, yeah. I agree. Yeah, and I think there's these efforts where they, you know, where, where the game is to sort of put the genie back in the box. So um, there's an issue with HarperCollins a few years back where they said, all these libraries, they're lending out eBooks and like we don't get the full benefit because like real books, they tend to wear out. And so libraries had to get more of the books. So our new rule is that you can only lend out an eBook like 28 times and after that, it falls apart. Sorry, you gotta buy a new eBook. And so it's like a nostalgia to like, remember the good old days when you always had to purchase books from us? Like, let's go, let's get back to that. Um, and, right, and, and so that's like, that's like a corporate nostalgia, right? Which I think is like actively like, you seem to be sort of crippling this technology largely for the purpose of like establishing or reifying like old flows of revenue. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I think there's, there's kind of this, part of this problem of like, disentangling like the design from the intention I think is really interesting like because I can they can always say like well you know you could make the argument not not really in that case but the publisher can make the argument that like people want their books to fall apart like that's like <laughs> one of the great things about books is that you can collect them and they're rare and like let's get back to that right like and so like there's lots of stories we can tell about why we want to institute nostalgia and from like a regulator's point of view it becomes very difficult to say like we're going to institute design choices that say like it has to be as robotic like as possible mm -hmm. yeah you know who has a, um, has a serious nostalgia uh, for the old days? What Robot does is uh, Soundwave, the Transformer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because he's like got this cassette tape. Yeah. And we moved on to CDs and MP3s. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right. So uh, a, a quick observation. Sorry to limit you, but a couple minutes. Um, uh, and we'll go to 10 o'clock. We'll take a 10 minute break. But please. Matt, I yeah. just have a quick question. Um, I'm wondering if you guys can talk about how political framing within the theater, 
view of this. Um, how do you think that that impacts this interaction between the person and the device, whatever it is? And I, what it made me think of was um, the difference between autofill cases and the role of law. So we're talking about the law saying you should have to design things a certain way um, so that people will perceive them in this way. But in autofill cases, it seems like just holding Google liable for bad things like Meg Jones is a fill in the blank. Um, in, in Europe, I can sue Google for that. Um, in, in the US, it's perceived as a machine. It's an aggregate, you know, it's an algorithmic process that uh, no one's judging me. It's just, you know, it, it's just a machine that's saying a certain thing. Um, and I wonder about how liability may change that relationship and the ability to have a really convincing theater experience. That's interesting. That's like, so it's sort of, sort of reminiscent of Evan's initial point, right, about like the difference between objective and subjective experiences of accountability, right? I mean, you could imagine, well, you can imagine like different things happening, right? Like, so on one level, you know, we could just have like a different regulatory structure, a different legal rule about who's accountable, which I think is, you know, what you're getting out of, you know, with the difference between like US and European law around autofill. Um, versus like people might just like behave differently if they believe that they had some some volition in that situation, right? Like we know, you know, legal studies people know very well, right? That there are lots of reasons people decide to bring claims or decide to, you know, against whom they're gonna bring claims, right? And especially in the case of accidents or in the case of some loss or, you know, some like like a very visceral harm, um, you know, that, that people, you know, are very, very, like are very much subjected to kind of like emotional reasons for, um, you know, internalizing fault. Uh, so yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have like a, a great answer to your question either. But it raises an interesting point, right? Which is, I think, the multidimensionality of, of accountability and how it plays out in different ways. Yeah, when the autofill case, I wonder whether or not like the uh, the conceptual theater of like the robot itself is sort of this uh, this liability shell game you can play. So what I mean by that is like if we design it to look sufficiently robot like you know, a person can say like, well, I put this robot in the world, but it's a robot, so it behaves on its own, and I, if you really, it's not my fault, mm -hmm. right? Um, versus this thing where we design it so it's like, oh, it's like a tool that I built for you, and you used it, and it harmed you. Like, okay, well, now, now I'm, I'm kind of responsible, right? And so, like, there's this way of potentially designing objects to look robot-like to the extent that you can sort of make these comfortable arguments where it's like, I'm not actually the one responsible. And so, so the game might be there to hide functionality in like something that looks like it has its own, you know, its, its own mechanism, its own volition as a way of kind of diffusing fault. Um, and, and I wonder that whether or not that's a, that's, a, that's a game that like manufacturers will play, whether or not that's a game that like platform designers will play like as in the autofill case, right? Where they can say like the system was so complicated and we kind of put it out there and it behaved on its own. And, and so if you get the Meg Ryan as a blank, then, then that's that. Um, and so, yeah, basically the use of like the tropes of robots as a way of like hiding fault, I think is kind of an interesting ploy, I guess, if you're trying to think about how you, how you use it in like a liability sense. Yeah, I, I mean, along those lines, I think you could hypothesize that the more volition it feels like you have, the less likely you are to even start to question the system, right? So like one of the examples we mentioned briefly in the paper actually has to do with like animal psychology, um, where like there are these studies that show that if... You know, if rats are getting electrical shocks, um, but you give them a lever that's like not connected to anything, they actually like have better, like they they experience less stress if they're pressing that button than if they're not given a button to press, right? Even though it has like nothing to do with the, it has like zero to do with the amount of shock that they receive, but like their subjective experience of it is different if they feel like they have some control. Um, and so like I'm not in the rat brain, right? But like you could conceive of like if if you you know if that does in fact import to human experience. Um, you know, the degree to which you're sort of distracted by, you know, believing that you have some level of volition that's like preventing or, or um, exacerbating the circumstances you're in, like you're maybe not questioning like, well, why am I getting shocked in the first place? Like who's bringing that about? Um, but you'd have to do obviously some empirical research to see if that's the case. Yeah, I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I think we need to end it there. So oh, sure, oh, sure, yeah. Yeah. So please join me in thanking this, this fabulous panel. Thanks. 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 Great question. Uh,
We'll see you back here in 10 minutes. We'll have another uh, paper, and then we'll have lunch. I apologize. We uh, didn't think to serve placenta, but Karen, uh, if you want to... Um, but we have sandwiches, and we have more food than yesterday. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>